it okay ravinder everything is can we start yes yes start vinita ma'am aha uh -huh, start and a very good afternoon to everybody uh, i welcome you again to this seventh day uh, second session at uh, 130 onwards uh, which we have on cinema as classroom of the senses exploring cultural form pedagogy and self reflexity for the session we have with us professor ravi vasudevan sir is the professor at center for the study of developing societies sarai csds media and urban studies program sir work in the area of film and media history with ravish sundaram he directs sarai the csds media and urban studies program professor vasudevan is the editorial advisor to the film and media studies journals screen cinema and sai reprint and the historical journal of film radio and television he is guest faculty in film studies at jawaharlal nehru university jadavpur university and ambedkar university delhi sir is also involved in shaping the thematics of the icas module history as political category and has designed and inaugurated a new thematic module media and the constitution of the political with tapti guha tharu thakurta vasudevan coordinates research in icas sarai csds cssc project sir uh, has public his publication include making meaning in indian cinema co-edited by uh, co-edited in sarai reader the cities of everyday life and sarai reader media crisis the mark special issue documentary now mark and the melodramatic public film form and spectatorship in indian cinema professor vasudevan co-founded and edits the journal bioscope south asian screen studies now in its 10th year of publication Sir is currently working on non-fiction film structures, the film archives, and the questions of his historiography, post-cinema media, artifacts, and political imaginaries, along with media histories of advertising, publicity, and public relations. We welcome you, sir, all for this session, and definitely we are really honored, and I am thankful on behalf of uh, IQAC Atma Ram Sanatan Dharma College. and elc ramanujan college that you have uh, just spared certain uh, uh, time for your from your busy schedule to be present here to share your knowledge with the participants thank you sir thanks a lot for being there for us and over to you now sir uh, thank you very much dr gupta and uh, it's been a, it's a pleasure to uh, make uh, uh, give a talk on uh, this subject uh, on uh, about cinema education and society and uh, i'm just about to share my screen uh, uh i wanted to just say briefly uh, that this is somewhat exploratory i'm trying to work through various you know possible things which might engage or interest you uh and this moves between uh two different well several different types of cinema but uh the history of non fiction film is one of the components um and but i'm also drawing on uh, fiction film including more broadly entertainment cinema uh, to think about uh, questions of education and here i will just kind of broadly amplify the question of education to encompass um, uh, certain other categories uh, much more simply the question of information uh, rather than edu education is obviously much more complicated way of imparting information uh, it is uh, i mean it's an highly it's much more organized in terms of thinking about how do you constitute knowledge huh? and how do you relay knowledge and information tends to be simpler in terms of its attributes or what range of things it seeks to impart or tell uh, but apart from information and education i just wanted to put out one more thing there which is I, what uh, dr gupta's the last bit of what dr gupta said self reflexivity which is also a kind of critical engage, critical awareness you know if you got education but also the ca category of critical awareness how does one actually think about educating oneself or opening one's sensibility one's point of view one's perspectives 
in terms of a critical engagement with the range of things uh, which are being told to you, how you rationally discern or uh, distinguish between different types of information, come to certain judgments about the value of, di of different types of information, different points of view as well. Uh, I think one of the interesting things about uh, uh, cinema and of course broadly think, uh, uh, artworks at, at large, uh, including of course the novel, but also painting and other forms, is that you are invited, they invite you when they are actually doing interesting, uh, working out in interesting aesthetic and other possibilities, they invite you to reflect on a series of things, a series of ways of looking, uh, which I think is uh, the ultimate horizon in a sense of a certain type of critical aptitude, which we can call education uh, as well, and education of sensibilities, et cetera. So any, I'll come back to some of that uh, in a short while. Let me share the, my screen with you first. So um, just broadly flagging a series of things for us to look at. I will try and show you at least a couple of uh, film sequences, uh, extracts in the course of time. Sometimes because of the, uh, I've had to use stills uh, from films rather than actually show film sequences uh, for various technical reasons. But I hope I'll be able to communicate a sense of how we can use cinema to think about education. And here I'm just opening up the field of cinema in terms of the range of senses that it kind of uh, operates, what how it operationalizes a whole series of sensory possibilities. So often, in fact, the first thing which we think about is actually seeing or looking uh, as a kind of critical dimension of what the cinema offers. Uh, and that is true, uh, but there's also of course sound. And of course, uh, within these dimensions, you can operate, you can uh, discern other subtler differences. So uh, when we're, we're thinking about film technology and the camera, and we are thinking of a whole series of things which it enables us to do, uh, enables us to look in different ways. So you can have obviously, and this is not, this is not something novel to you. You yourself would have thought about all of these things uh, to a greater or lesser degree. But the question is that how close do we come to something? You know, a short distance, the actual frame, how the a figure or uh, a set of characters is situated within a landscape or the interior of a house. So the short distance composition and these kind of attributes are very important. Huh? Uh, 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 these these kind of attributes are very important in terms of how we are actually drawn into, uh, you know, the image drawn towards characters drawn towards the, their viewpoints. No? Uh, there are other things, lighting, art direction is increase, is extremely important. You know, how do you actually kind of frame the interior of a house? How is it actually being presented to us? How do we look at a scene from a village? In what ways can we uh, analyze a scene uh, from village life? It's one of the things I'll be talking about in a short while. Uh, and cinema is not just obviously it's still, it's about movement, you know? Uh, and it's also about time, uh, the time or the duration. Uh, how long is a shot held for? What is the reason for a shot being held so long and what effect does it have, that duration of the shot? You know? So these are uh, questions which um, in a sense define what type of meaning, what type of feeling huh, uh, film communicates. Uh, so these are various things I just want you to keep in mind. Huh? I won't be able to address all of this, but it's something for us to just flag. And perhaps we, uh, towards the end of the session, we can come back uh, with some discussion about some of these things in the wake of stuff we have seen, of things we are looking at and hearing, uh, but also uh, which you yourself may have observed about the cinema in, uh, in relationship to some of these issues. I also want to flag, go back to the question about that it may not be only one thing 
which the cinema is doing. It may be even telling you different things. Maybe the soundtrack is at variance from the image track. You know, there may be also little contrary impulses. Maybe what someone is saying is different from how the, the feeling that he or she relays to people. So there may be this, this uh, you know, uh, disjunctions, uh, kind of uh, contra contradictions between different dimensions, different sense, sensory kind of projections, even uh, how a person speaks, holds himself, what meaning uh, a particular action or a particular set of words uh, imparts. Uh, I just want to track back, you know, in terms of this question of information, uh, we have a long history uh, going back, of course, to the late 19th century, uh, but where cinema was specifically used uh, for simple things. It would be a question of capturing a street scene, capturing an official visit by, say, a viceroy, uh, a funeral ceremony. Uh, for example, one of the most famous early films was the funeral of Bal Gangadhar Tilak in 1920, it ex excited considerable, you know, kind of uh, interest and uh, passion uh, when it was screened at the cinema halls in 1920. Huh? Uh, and it was, it, it was a massive funeral procession uh, for Tilak. So there'd be those kinds of things, which, uh, which in a sense, precede the newsreel. Huh? The newsreel is the classic uh, kind of film uh, form, the film genre, if you want, uh, through which information is imparted, mostly in relationship to an official viewpoint rather than a, a varied or critical viewpoint. It tends to, by and large, relay the viewpoint of the government in power, in, in, but uh, sometimes more complicatedly than in other instances. Now, whether this is a colonial government or a national government, that is, by and large, the type of information it would relay. So it, ver it could verge also on propaganda. You know, so that you are not actually being invited to uh, to have a critical viewpoint or a critical understanding, but in fact you are being uh, told what uh, what is the official line about the state of the country or the state of the nation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that is more than. Like, but often you will find actually very interesting things when you look at news reads. This is where, despite what the intention of the filmmaker is, we nevertheless have opportunity sometimes to actually, let us call it, read the image, to interpret the image, to make it yield meanings and to gen generate knowledges, which were not necessarily part of the overt design of what, what was being uh, intended by, by this kind of official style movie. Of course, there was a minority thing. I say minority because it was an elite practice. Uh, a lot of people could not uh, afford uh, cameras. But so there's an elite uh, practice, what we now call home movies. There are lots of them available uh, online. Uh, usually these will be kind of films made by colonial officers, say a plantation manager, uh, again, a, a businessman, uh, uh, even some an, an, an engineer. Engineers were very, very uh, always trying to capture things. It could be uh, setting up a canal, an irrigation channel, a uh, dam, whatever, but the engineer was often an amateur filmmaker as well. So we have a considerable repository of that type of uh, information, uh, which becomes an important archive. You know, archive is another dimension when you're thinking about history, uh, which becomes particularly relevant for us. Uh, so there would be this kind of simple things like what we call instructional films. They're telling you, uh, these are the new seeds, this is how they can be planted, this is new fertilizer forms. Uh, this is how to kind of maintain hygiene. Public health became a big, big issue then and now in colonial times and in the contemporary, as we well know. In fact, uh, when you uh, think about all this, you'll automatically think of going to going to the internet, finding out how to do something. So do it yourself videos, which are now commonplace. You can imagine back in the early 20th century, these are being relayed through films, sometimes cumbersome projection devices, which may be carried by say railways, by motor vans into the countryside to educate and impart information about how to improve, improve agriculture, how to improve, uh, maintain and secure public health, good uh, sanitation, etc. So these would be very commonplace. Uh, right now, of course, we know every day and there's the message on the phone telling us how to kind of conduct ourselves in terms of the COVID uh, outbreak. Mm. Um, 
So there were a lot of these things. I wanted to show you one now. What I'll do is I'll exit, I'll share, you, share with you a video so that we can actually see something. So back in 1941, uh, we have a film which is actually what would be called in terms of film genres, an industrial process film. What is an industrial process film? It's a film which imparts information, provides uh, knowledge about how a particular object is made uh, in the industry, in the factory. In this case, it's a particular object, which is a kerosene tin, a tin to store kerosene. And uh, the sponsor for the film is the Burma Shell uh, Oil uh, uh, Storage and Distributing Agency. It was a subsidiary of International Shell, the big oil corporation. And it was a very influential local player uh, as uh, both in the colonial period and after. And I'll come back to a bit of that. Bimal Roy, for those of you whose general knowledge is good, uh, would know is an iconic figure of the both of Bengal and Bombay film industries. And he started off as a cinematographer for new theaters in Calcutta. And then he graduated, he went by around the end of the Second World War to, to uh, Bombay, where he had a very uh, substantial career as a film, a filmmaker on the, not on the more artistic literary side of, of cinema, rather than the kind of major entertainment filmmaker. Although he has one or two very big entertainment hits like Madhumati uh, uh, in the late 50s. And of course, the iconic Devdas. Uh, uh, the Dilip Kumar version you know, of 1955. He, in fact, was the cinematographer for the 1935 version of Devdas, uh, which featured K.L. Segal in the Hindi version. So let me try and exit this and get you to see Tins for India. This is an eight minute film. It gives you a sense about a particular type of informational film, and we can Talk, I'll reflect a bit on it uh, to see what kinds of, why it's, worth, why, why it's worth reflecting on as a kind of educational form. Is it quite clear? The film, Anjali? Uh, is it clear? Sir, you are showing the presentation, dear, sir. Your video is not visible to us. It's not visible? Oh, dear. Yes. Visible is not, it's not showing. The video is not no, showing? Sir, it is not showing. Sir. Amit, is it showing? It's a problem. No, no, it's not showing. Actually, sir, uh, you have to minimize it. And uh, uh, again, you have to share your video. First, you play it and share it. OK, OK. Let me. So I have minimized my. Uh, PowerPoint. Huh? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That I've done. Huh? You have to open your video, then share, then play. Okay. Okay. First, sir, stop sharing this screen. Stop sharing. Uh, stop share. Yes. Stop share. Yes. Now, now play your video and then share it. Can you see it now? Sir, please share it again. Communist sites in this vast country. Palm tree, bullock cart. Sir, what Amit is saying, yes, yes, yes sir, yes, it is visible yes, now, sir. No, no, visible no, no. and audible, sir. Yeah. Perfect. Most villages and towns, kerosene tin, serve some useful purpose. After... Is it clear now? It's okay? Yes, sir. Okay. Excellent route. The metal is cut 
to make a host of articles of everyday use, such as the lamp you see here. The tins provide containers for rice, dal, sugar, salt, and the among other daily needs. Details like this in every Indian bazaar. Kerosene tins. They play important parts in our everyday lives, and their story is worth the telling. Stacked by the ton. In this factory alone, 20,000 tins are made every day. The rolling mills of India produce 16,000 tons of tin plate each year to make these tins. Here, the factories are opened. The tins are made to an exact specification. For example, they are all 1 80th of an inch thick. The sheets are smooth, bright, and shiny. Now, the tin plates start on their journey through the machinery which shapes them into a finished thing. Here, the plates are trimmed and hemmed. Hemmed is a small flap that bends on each side of the plate. These form the seams of the tin. Marking and lettering is impossible. At the same time, the tin edges are bent in the form of a book. For the edges to fall away, the plates are bent into a right angle, forming two sides of the tin. Here, the two halves of the body of the tin are joined. The hoops bend over a bit less to complete each other and form the seams. Here is the body of the tin. Cuts, shapes, and stamps the bottoms in one action. Here the tops are being made. The tops and bottoms are now joined to the body of the tin in a machine called the squeezer. Seams are tightened. So, in such a short space of time, smooth tin plates can be made into a four gallon tin. But these tins are not yet complete. Here they enter upon their last and most important treatment. All the seams are soldered so that they may be finally sealed. First, one seam is heated by a naked flame beneath the carrier. Sticks of solder are constantly fed into the trough. The tins are turned so that the opposite seam receives the same treatment. Then they are turned again, so that the top and bottom seams are soft. Seam tip. Finished now, all except for one small but important detail. to the handle of the shoe. Here, the small strips of metal that now fit movement of the tin are cut and shaped. The shaping of the handle is the only part of the process which is done by hand. In fact, the tins are touched as little as possible. They go, the finished seam tins. They are on their way to be filled with oil. They will carry oil to the vast Indian public, to the rich and to the poor. 
They will be seen in the bazaars. They will be prominent on market days. They will bring kerosene to the remotest corners of India. But this is only the beginning of their life of service. The durability and strength of these tins is known to every villager, and he puts them to use in a hundred different ways, in his home <coughs> and in his fields. No package in the world gives so varied a service to so many people. Okay, uh, can you have, hear and see my see the PowerPoint? Yes, sir, okay. it is visible now, sir, and you're audible, sir. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, okay, yeah. Uh, this is the frustration of this uh, Zoom type of teaching that- uh, yes, otherwise sir, would, that is there. <laughs> it, no, it would be it would been very nice just to have a response of the, uh, of the class yes. uh, to, to the film. But let me, I, what we can do is, uh, I'm sure you'll have, uh, ideas and responses. So towards the end of the session, we keep time aside. Uh, yes, in the sir, meanwhile, we'll open the uh, chat box at around in another maybe 20 minutes, sir, and okay. 20 or 30 minutes, sir, till then the session is going on. Yeah. And then I'll take up the questions or you can also have a look at the chat box and come up fine. with the questions. Fine, fine. Just to ensure, sir, that the, uh, that, uh, the speaker is not getting distracted. We don't open the chat box. Just fine. Normally. No, no. That's excellent. No, no, that if makes you want it, sir, we can do that. No, 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 no. no. Uh, this is the correct way because otherwise it becomes distracted. Sir, we'll open the uh, chat box in another half an hour, sir. Thank yeah, you. Fine, fine, fine. Ah, so, yes. Now, let me briefly kind of... Uh, uh, describe or discuss that film huh? just for you to uh, just for us to be able to focus the theme thematic uh, thing around education information etc so now what is interesting i mean i'm just in terms of film form you know there's an aesthetic to the way the film is organized and one of the interesting things is that you'll see this kind of uh, it's like a, a fine mirroring of the beginning and the end so you have the entry of the bullock cart with the kerosene tins and it closes with the departure of the bullock cart with the kerosene tins. And this is meant to be an iconographic picture. It summarizes, in a sense, according to the narrator, the person who's voiceover, that this is what these, these objects, uh, in a sense, represent uh, in rural India, what they call the real India. You know, So the bullock cart, the palm tree, uh, and the kerosene tin. The kerosene tin is, of course, an intervention. It's a novel thing. Uh, which is transforming the nature of village life. The, and then there are two dimensions. One is, of course, uh, the fact that this has this wide usage uh, beyond its original function, which was to ca store kerosene and carry it. So there are a range of things which, as you, uh, you would have seen, making roofs, uh, carrying water, uh, keeping dal and travel and whatever in the grocer shop, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, um, so the, it, it is not only functional for what it is meant to do, but it does this. The, at the center of the film, though, is, of course, the industrial process film. 
from point to point how different dimensions of the tin from its point to the point when it is cut uh, to the point when it is actually kind of made into a uh, into a, a box a box uh, we see from point to point how it works and what is interesting is the type of way it there the are two dimensions always with cinema and especially this type of cinema one must think what is being shown huh? and perhaps what cannot be shown and i will come back to that what cannot be shown this is often a question in cinema more generally what can be made visible and what cannot be made visible for whatever reason uh, in this case you'd say that it's uh, what is of great interest is the focus and the breakdown of the actual making of the tin into smaller units so you're seeing actually particular technologies particular equipment huh? and what will often happen in a lot of the shots is the human body is cut the human body is not a, a certain dimension of the human body the hand uh, the midriff but not necessarily the face huh? uh, and sorry one second uh, uh, the the face is not is often not shown. Suddenly, when you actually see a top angle shot, now the top angle shot gives you a, a larger perspective on the space which is being covered, hmm. and then you see a whole number of people. But then, by and large, it is. Excuse me for one second. Hello. Hello. Yes. Hello. Uh, yes, sorry, sorry for that. Um, so, we, what is, uh, in a sense, the human body is abstracted huh, in large part of this. It becomes a support to the actual technological process. Huh? And so, you don't see the face or the integrity of the body. The body is actually represented in, in, in relationship to one second. Yes, So sorry about that. There's some phone coming in, which I couldn't help. So sorry. So uh, the 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 body, huh? Is that part of it is which uh, relates to the actual technological process of the tin making is shown. Very important. When in this process of abstraction, several dimensions of the human form come into uh, into our view. One is the hand. The hand is extremely important. At one point, the narrator, the voiceover says. It is hardly touched, but it is so critical, obviously, for the hand to be able to maneuver and manage the actual machine as it is doing various things to the process. So the hand becomes very important. The other thing is, if you notice in several, several shots, the eye becomes very important. Huh? Uh, and uh, there's actual also the question which is suggested that heat is extremely important. When we talk about senses, we get the sense of the smoke, the fumes, and the level of the heat and at one point, there's a kind of thermometer which is being looked at here. So you get actually a sense of this sensory expansion. One, there's peculiarly a sensory depletion, focus. Body is actually abstracted into a certain function or a support for a technological uh, process which facilitates. But it may be re-aggregated, it becomes a larger thing when you have the top angle shot, you see the, the view on the factory, a larger view on the factory. But then you get a precision how is the human body, in a sense, being remodeled huh, or being oriented through the factory process and through this machinic engagement huh, uh, to certain dimensions of which are very precise to the modern factory age? You know, the eye and the hand, huh, and also the actually and the, uh, another thing which I feel the capacity to remain still. You have to actually be still in order to be able to kind of manage these various functions. So in a sense, the machine becomes an assemblage within which the human body becomes a functional entity. Now, it's a, so in a sense, the, doc, the film can actually documents a certain transformation, not only in an object, tin into a, a tin box, but also a transformation in the nature of the human body huh? and the human sense perception and how it has to be oriented in order to perform these functions. These are new. It is the factory age. 
So these are levels of awareness and of, if you want, education about which go beyond the immediate remit of the film, which is a very interestingly worked out film, but it, you, it can disclose more information than is immediately apparent. Of course, there is a very large body of what we'd call industrial documentaries of this sort uh, in the 1920s and 30s all over the world. Some become extremely famous in terms of their experimental capacity. They look at uh, the way they look and organize, use cinema to actually engage, look at these things. And of course, there can be very famous ones, some of which I'm sure you're aware of, like modern, uh, modern times huh, of Charlie Chaplin, uh, his, uh, the comedy. It becomes a kind of comedy of how his body malfunctions, as it were, when it is uh, uh, faced with the machine. The other thing which I wanted to uh, just uh, draw your attention to is what can certain type of film show and what it cannot show. So one of the things which I, I was very, I've seen it obviously several times. Uh, so when I was talking about these dimensions, the fact of the hand having to be quite precise and it's quite close to the thing, you, you do think accident. Huh? What, what happens if the hand slips? What happens if it actually there's a little kind of uh, misstep? Uh, the, the foot is also at one point, of course, also there's a pedal uh, which is, is operated. So there are a number of things where, where you'd say the industrial film will, cannot and will not show something going wrong. It has to show everything going right, you know? Uh, there, there could be an, another thing which is more analytic, which is an industrial accident. Uh, and that industrial, which is not necessarily an industrial accident film, it would be an industrial safety film, how to be safe. And there would, but in the process, there will be some exploration of what risk the human body is being subject to. Hmm? So here's something. This is a minuscule film, eight minutes, but it actually can disclose quite a lot. I suggest the other thing it does is that when we open cinema to actually into a conversation with itself, it becomes interesting as to what range of viewpoints open up. For example, what we've seen and, uh, uh, in this film is an image of village life huh? in the around 1940-41, filtered through a particular preoccupation, which is to see how tin has actually, in a sense, remodeled or changed the nature of the material dimensions of village life. Huh? But we must then think that the village cinema, the cinema which actually focuses on the village, and it was very, a very important site of uh, the fiction film of entertainment cinema, like Devdas, which was made a few years before this. Uh, this film invites us to look at those films slightly differently, because often the village is from Devdas in 1935 through, through to Ray's great Pater Pantali in 1955. The village is often seen as a site of simplicity, huh? hardly touched by the modern world or modern technology. But in fact, if we juxtapose these things, we realize indeed that kerosene, for example, coming into these spaces alters the nature of energy, uh, that the tin also does that, and tin materially recomposes the nature of everyday life. So uh, as opposed to the simplicity and the static quality of village life, which is often retailed to us in social films of that period, we may, when we put these different films together, get a different type of image of exactly what cinema is disclosing about the world and the way the world is composed. So this is, we can come back in, uh, to a conversation about this a little later you know, as to the juxtaposition or the keeping together of different types of cinema you know, and what type of, uh, this, uh, what type of revelation, what type of new information, what type of new line of thought or thinking uh, opens up by this. Many of these people were actually doing dual jobs or triple jobs. They are known uh, for the work they did in entertainment and art, but often they were also uh, working in simple, these kind of documentaries which are sponsored to promote various commodities, to uh, kind of promote, uh, to communicate a sense of the uh, developmental transformation which was taking place, whether in terms of big dams, steel factories, those kind of things, along with the fiction films which they were making. So uh, cinema actually is made up of very complicated 
set of uh, uh, forms uh, which may have a interanimating dimension. They interact, they build conversation, they can build conversations uh, to talk about cultural and material transformation in interesting ways. Sorry, I'm just moving forward. Uh, the other thing is, of course, that uh, fiction film may itself be used to impart instruction, uh, have pedagogical functions. Uh, but uh, what we, uh, and I will point to that, just to give you an instance of that kind of thing, uh, where it's doing that. Of course, current day cinema does it as well, uh, very powerfully. If you think about Akshay Kumar, for example, and the films he's made around uh, sanitary napkins and uh, female uh, uh, health, uh, sanitary health, uh, big entertainment films as well, which was successful. So it's it's not uh, it's, it's not an unusual thing. It periodically does surface in more or less sophisticated ways that you are actually imparting instruction and building a certain type of uh, public knowledge and a public awareness and to cultivate a certain new habit, a new habit, if you want. Uh, so that goes way back as well. Um, but this thing about not only what we're looking at, but how it circulates and for whom it was meant for huh, becomes another important dimension to, to understand what the cinema is doing, what role it is performing huh, and how it is meant to kind of communicate certain ideas to different types of audiences. So all, the differences amongst audiences is important, how these films circulate, where, uh, how they are shown. For example, uh, films were shown to peasant audiences, rural audiences, um, by railway. The railway, uh, railway was, there was a cinema car in the 1920s and 1930s, for example, uh, which would take uh, films out. Then there'd be a screening outside the, the railway bogey. Uh, uh, and uh, there'll be lectures and there'd also be kind of other slideshows and films and, uh, to impart information. So you have different types of spaces, different types of contexts, within which cinema is actually doing its work of communicating uh, various ideas uh, and attempts to transform the nature of life. So there are a number of publications. This one, the Thomas has uh, there's a Hediger and Vondero, a book called Films That Work, trying to show exactly how these industrial movies, what role they perform in relationship to what type of audiences and interests. So the, this is a, there are various settings as I've suggested in which the cinema goes and how the, uh, and the audiences it seeks to uh, communicate with. So this have, these are just kind of highlight images. I was not sure I was going to be able to show you the video. So I was just kind of taking you through images, which we can talk about later if this is of a thing, because I think it's a very interesting film, which offers a lot of um, space for a discussion. Mm. This is what I've just told you about, about the material transformation of the village and how juxtaposing the information film and small documentary along with fiction film enables a new kind of perspective. So this would be a char characteristic situation uh, within which uh, peasant audiences would be, uh, films would be exhibited for. This would be outside, uh, sometimes that'd be dual functions. A railway, uh, a bogey would be dedicated, for example, to have a cinema car uh, and in which the projection unit and the generator and various things were available. And there would also be bazaar trains uh, in which, uh, which would, uh, there'd be shopping units, usually pandering to specific things which would be of interest to rural consumers. So there'd be something like say fertilizer, that would be an important thing, uh, concrete, uh, cement, uh, but there will also be uh, watches. If you look at this, this would be the space within which, say, a cinema exhibition would be due to take place in the evening. And you'll see in front a kind of row of uh, uh, English officials huh? who are the kind of female, but then there are all these kind of uh, a multitude of children and, uh, and men, very few women in this kind of public space. Huh? But this would be the kind of setting within which a cinema would be screened. And there'd be more than just instructional movies. There'd be short com uh, comic films. There'd be films about pilgrimage. They wanted to encourage a traveling habit also amongst uh, 
uh, rural uh, audiences and consumers. So to encourage them to travel uh, to pilgrim uh, on pilgrimage for holidays, etc., was another objective of the cinema show. Uh, how to encourage that? So these are characteristic images of that. Hmm. So this is an instance of what I had described to you, which, sorry, I'll just go back one second. Yeah, when cinema itself becomes a vehicle of instruction, information, public pedagogy of some sort. Hmm. So here's a very famous film, Achut Kanya, uh, Untouchable uh, Woman, Girl, uh, made in 1936 by Bombay Talkies. Um, under the direction of the German director, Franz Austin. Uh, and this couple of sequences uh, feature uh, events in the a grocery shop, huh? run not by a Baniya, but by a, a Brahmin uh, in this case, uh, a progressive uh, figure who is actually fully aware of, for example, of modern medicine. And he's actually pitted against the local Ved um, uh, because he's uh, offering quinine free, huh? uh, whereas the other guy is giving something else and charging for it, and it's not helping. So it's an anti-malaria, and so there, there will be this dimension of uh, in a fiction film, which is primarily a romance film, but a romance which is doomed because it is a intercaste romance between a Brahmin and a Dalit, uh, with a very glamorous. Uh, uh, present uh, Dalit woman, played by the very famous actress of that time, Devika Radi. Hmm. I don't think I'm going to show, because we are, have to be a bit watchful about time, so I'm not going to show this to you, but I just was telling you what the basic setup is. Huh? Uh, modern medicine versus traditional superstition. So then there's another context where so you have Ashok Kumar and Devika Rani. Huh? Let me talk over this. Uh, basically, this is um, a scene in which the mother of Pratap, that's the Brahmin boy played by Ashok Kumar, is deeply disturbed uh, because he, she discovers that Kasturi, uh, the, the girl, has been feeding with her own hand uh, Ashok Kumar. And uh, they, they prohibit it. Uh, well, the father does not. He's a progressive. But the mother prohibits it. Please notice Wimco. That's not only is it about instruction, it's about advertising. So Western Indian Match Company is also prominently kind of displayed in the background. Mm. It would be featuring on one of those bazaar trades as well. Mm. So now there's a whole discussion about interdining uh, between castes. And there's a very uh, highly prominent bypasser, uh, bystander who listens in uh, with uh, and does not approve of what he hears. So it's as if there's a public inside which is being mobilized, a, a conservative public huh? is represented by a by, bypass, uh, bystander who passes by. Now, this is when the mother is telling uh, Pratap off that you cannot do this. It is not allowed and you must stop doing it, uh, dining with Kasturi. Hmm. So now you have the public inside uh, uh, the film, which is a censorious public. Huh? Uh, disapproves of what it shares. Now, what we as an audience are being invited to do is to reflect on one key thing. In fact, the film opens very powerfully with an important event. Uh, Dukhia, poor fellow, that's his name, uh, who is the uh, uh, signal man and Kasturi's father has, uh, is in danger because he's just been bitten by a snake. And what we see is uh, Pratap's father, that progressive Brahmin whom we just looked to saw, take his foot or the wound in his mouth and suck the poison out. So this is again 
the question of touch uh, and of actual proximity, of intimate proximity, uh, which is actually mobilized, and the anxiety around it as an intercaste interdiction. Uh, so uh, giving uh, Kast uh, Kasturi feeding Pratap, uh, the father actually uh, sucking out the blood, as uh, the poison from his friend, the untouchable watchman, the, the Dalit watchman. So these are dimensions where different sense perceptions are being activated, along with this picture of a censorious public within the space and thing, but we are invited to look differently into this. So this is where the sense perception and its mobilization becomes very important. This I'll just leave out, that's all right. Now I want to now go, uh, Anjali, can you tell me how much time I have Sir, uh, another five minutes or so, because uh, it will take around 15 to 20 minutes for the questions that are going okay. to we'll be okay. opening the chat box now. Sir. Okay, give me, okay, what I'm going to do is to simplify things, I'm just going to show two clips. Huh. Uh, okay. That will give you, uh, because right now, until now, I've been by and large looking at the nonfiction film and how it actually uh, can be productively used to think about education and a kind of critical awareness with a focus around things like sense perception how the cinema itself draws us into different dimensions of certain experiences, like for example, work in the factory would be one instance, but also life in the village or how the village is materially composed. Here, I'm going to just shift to the fiction film and I'm going to just uh, show you two clips because we're running out of time. Yes, and that will be the basis at least for a discussion. Yes, and here I'm thinking specifically about something which we have just looked at, which is about social hierarchy and to how to think about social hierarchy, uh, especially relations of caste, of jati, uh, those dimensions, uh, and how fiction film uh, explored this, uh, uh, this uh, and what ways in which it sought to transform a public perspective on these matters. Hmm. So I'm going to show a couple of clips. The first is from a film by D.G. Falke, now, a lot of early cinema is only available to us in a fragmented form. Uh, only bits and pieces are often available. Uh, there is a, a set of uh, uh, clips, how they, you know, the form in which they're presently available at the National Film Archive. I don't know if that is the way they were intended or the way they were shown, but there's a film which is called Sri Krishna Janma, made in 1980. And I just wanted to show you one uh, uh, clip which relates to the uh, appearance of Vishnu. And uh, Vishnu is, there's just a simple, extremely uh, simple single shot setup. The single shot setup is punctuated by what were intertitles. You know, we do not subtitles, there's no sound, so there's no speech. So the intertitles with explaining what the uh, upcoming image is about. And this was very simply, basically the four, uh, castes. So it is uh, Brahmin, then Kshatriya, and then Vaishya, and then Shudra. Huh? And so each title then brings a family huh? deriving from this caste in front of Vishnu, having a darshan of Vishnu, just as we, the audience in a sense, is having a darshan of Vishnu. Huh? Uh, and in each of these cases, the, the intertitles separate out each caste from the other until the conclusion when all the castes come together. And that becomes an interesting thing. It's the same single shot setup, but it actually, there's a lot of interesting visual information for us to read and to uh, work on in that. I may just show it to you and then perhaps we can discuss it. Huh? The second one I'll show rapidly afterwards, and maybe not all of it. Uh, so if that is a 1918 Sri Krishna Janma, D.G. Falke, 1936, I think, um, Fatilal and Damle, uh, two important filmmakers of the Prabhat Film Studio in Pune, made a film called Sant Tukaram, which is one of the most famous uh, films in Indian cinema, uh, essentially about the devo devotion of uh, Tukaram, uh, who was a devotee of another Vishnu uh, incarnation, that is Pandurang. Uh, and how he actually develops uh, these uh, verses, which are uh, demotic in the sense they are popular 
language and he uh, in, in opposition to the high scriptural language of Brahmanical control. Mm -hmm. And uh, these abhangs, which he actually kind of produces, become uh, a key dimension of how, in a sense, the social world is being changed. Uh, so the devotion to the Lord does not require knowledge of the scriptures or knowledge of Sanskrit, but of these, these terms. And uh, this, uh, if I have the time, I'll show you a moment where Shivaji and Tuka meet, and Shivaji wants to actually give up his worldly uh, uh, duties because he feels that he must give up all material desire and uh, sublimate himself in the Lord. And Tuka is dis deeply disturbed. He says, you must maintain your, your duty as, 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 a, as a king. It's important for all of us to do so. So let me try and share this with you now. Okay, I don't have to share. I think I can move forward. I was going to show you another very nice advertising film, but we don't have time. So let's see. Okay. Okay, I think uh, I'll just very briefly kind of uh, discuss those two sequences and then we can actually open up uh, the chat. Is that all right? Yes, sir, it's all right. We can have a discussion and then we'll switch over to the chat, sir. Okay, okay. So let me briefly describe uh, why uh, I was looking at those. As you saw with uh, Achut Kanya already, uh, cinema is addressing this question of this social hierarchies, differences and uh, uh, caste uh, uh, interdictions, prohibitions, etc. Uh, more generally, and the 1930s uh, with Sri Krishna Janma, there's one specific thing I want to draw your attention to, which is the type of information, and the type of read, how one can read the image uh, which uh, is put before the audience. So we saw this fourfold distinction between uh, Brahmin, Kshatriya, Vaishya, and uh, Shudra, uh, and the and each uh, is assembled as a small family unit. Huh? And with it, there's a particular dress and a particular kind of implement, which signals the uh, caste of, you know, the caste affiliation or uh, what the thing they do in the world, whether it's a sword or it is a hoe. Or, and then there's a, uh, agri uh, a hoe for uh, breaking the earth. Interestingly, you will notice that the f there are five actual segments there, not four. Uh, the fifth is not actually identified except by the broom not as a separate, separately named uh, formation, but simply by the broom, uh, the jhadu, which is actually moving in the frame. So it is actually an undescribed dimension of the lower caste and uh, the, Dalits, uh, the Dalit world. The final integration uh, suggests that the cinema, even on the basis of its limited, at that time, extremely limited capacity, it's only single shots, which it is using single shot setups, not multiple shot. When we build a sequence, you have multiple shots, no? organized across uh, to build a sense of time 
and more uh, uh, complex storytelling. Here you have single shot setups. In the final shot, all casts converge under Vishnu, suggesting the possibility of their co-presence. They are not separated. And yet there's this peculiar, peculiar figuration of the jadu moving in the, in, the, in, in, in the top line of the thing, as if there's a, what you call a visual excess. The visual excess has already been there. It has been signaled. And the idea is that you leave all dharma and come under my protection, huh? under my sharan. Uh, in, in, in Braj. Uh, Braj becomes the facilitator for this co-presence, the bringing of this entire distinguished world, a stratified world into me. And yet there are these peculiar excesses, something to think about. Huh? But this is where the readability of the image becomes very important. There's very minimal uh, information otherwise being uh, relayed. Finally, on Santukara, what is of interest here is actually a legitimation of the Varnashram Dharma. At one level, he is reprimanding, Tukaram is reprimanding Shivaji for thinking he should cease to fulfill his kingly duty, his obligation as a warrior. He, should, uh, uh, he had wanted to give that up, to give up his worldly desire and to actually kind of uh, sub submit to a life of devotion. So this he tells him is not correct. And all, everyone, should abide by their worldly duty, the duty which is assigned to them, if you want, in the world. It seems to be, in a sense, a very conservative uh, uh, point of view, reiterating the division of castes and the ascriptive identity. And yet, something interesting happens. And this is where I'll conclude. Uh, it's an extraordinarily mobile scene, as opposed to what we've just seen in Sri Krishna Janma. You've got the camera actually mobile. It's actually capturing this peculiar effect of his movement, his dance-like rhythm and invocation of the Abhang as he invokes Pandura, you know, and supplicates to Pandura. And at the climax, he's demanding from Pandura, huh, in a sense, that you must now, my devotion should merit uh, that you come and protect uh, Shivaji and everyone from this attack which is taking place. What is interesting here is a huge, a differentiated public made up, made up of different groups and uh, caste clusters, I think. Everyone becomes Shivaji at this moment. You know, all the, the, there's complete consternation in the enemy camp because wherever they look, they could see Shivaji everywhere. And it's a peculiar sense, uh, a sense of how sovereignty, uh, the position of the king is distributed in society. Now, I was talking to a friend yesterday and said, that is true, that is what is happening, but in a peculiar sense, it's a consolidation of Maratha identity uh, within, within the rural peasant uh, and uh, uh, community. So the peasant, uh, merchant, various figures in the rural area will uh, come together. So, you know, so there are complexities there. It's not just an equivalence. There may be a way in which a new identity is being formed uh, through the ages of Shivaji. But at the other level, it's the cinema by using its techniques of superimposition makes everyone the same uh, in this fashion. Just as in a sense with Krishna, with Vishnu, you brought everyone under Vishnu's equalizing uh, uh, in, uh, capacity, the capacity to equalize everyone, to bring those who live separately together. But even with there, there's a certain ambiguity. I will bring this now to a conclusion, huh? because then we have I've already over short time. How, how much time do we have left, Anjali? Uh, Ma'am, sir, we have around 10 minutes. Sir. Oh, so sorry. So should we start looking at the chats? Will you also? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, sir, it is visible to you also. I will just read out some okay, of Okay, fine. Fine. There Fine. is uh, uh, a request by uh, Sasha Karma Yanchen. She is asking that could you show us the slide right before the train shot? Uh, I just missed it. Royce in the, the slide just before, uh, if it is possible. Uh, just yeah. before the train shots. Uh, oh, okay. That is where, where the interdining. And I the... think uh, she can have a uh, she can have a look in the recording that we will be coming. Okay. Up yes. Yes. Uh, there's a question by uh, Mr. Neeraj Kumar. He's saying that uh, he's uh, asking your suggestions on that how to read or analyze a film. 
and uh, some highlights uh, we can start with to become a good film critic. Oh, okay. I think you know you attend uh, Neeraj, is it? Neeraj? Okay. I think Neeraj, you know, Neeraj. it's really attention to detail. Huh? And by detail, I mean, for example, uh, what is in an image? How will you describe this image as uh, thickly as possible? Uh, so what we have just been doing, for example, that thing in Sri Krishna Janma, for example, we saw, you know, that there's one name, Shudra, but there's more than one figure represented. There, and what is made up, what dis defines these people? What defines? So, you know, you go into the detail, uh, for example, that the jhadu suddenly acquires a significance or a meaning. So one is that, but by not only the image itself, but how images are put together, you know, and what kind of meaning is developed by putting these images together. So I was suggesting, for example, Tins for India, the factory film, uh, that segment, you see this way it keeps on moving, moving between two or three different registers, where we're seeing the only a component of the human body in relationship to the activity of the machine. Uh, and periodically we get what's called a top shot, huh? where a higher angle shot, where you can see a larger, the larger context in which the wholeness of the human body in relationship to the machine world is shown. So then you build a pattern. So it's a question of understanding what the logic of this pattern is. But the first thing is pay attention with detail, to detail. It could be camera movement, it could be short distance. You know, short distance, like the close-up often becomes a very important dimension of the expression, what the person feels. Huh? So that becomes, but that doesn't, you don't go to a close-up straight away. Usually it is built, isn't it, within a sequence before you arrive at a particular position. So detail, the detail of the technique, the detail of the vi visual corner, sound. I've, just, I've not really been able to attend to the question of sound but it's so absolutely important now. One thing to look at, one of my favorite films in recent times, and I think a classroom of the senses, the, uh, and the Malayalam version of Drishya, which has now got a sequel. Huh? Please have a look at that film. <laughs> uh, and it, is, it, it tells you a lot about cinema huh? and uh, what cinema can teach us. <laughs> anyway. Uh, there is one other question by uh, Dr. Renu Singh. She is asking that could you suggest some uh, books to understand how to do film appreciation? Uh, mm -hmm. As uh, she also wants to know about film appreciation, what are the film uh, basic uh, theories of film theories which one must read? So, yeah. any suggestion on the books that can be looked into? So, you have already given a suggestion about a movie, a Malayalam movie, but she is asking for some suggestion on the books. Yeah, okay. You know, uh, there are a lot of books. Uh, is it possible for me to just send uh, a list, a few uh, items yes, to, uh, yes, for you to you distribute? Isn't that better? Be, that would be, yeah. be better, I think. Yeah, I'll do that, yeah. definitely. Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, another question by Dr. Lakshmi Pandey. She is asking that what advanced cultural changes are expected from Indian cinema and audience respectively? What are, is expected of uh, changes? What advanced huh? cultural changes are expected from Indian cinema and ah. audiences? Right, right, right. See, now we are undergoing a huge transformation. If that, if it, if it, if you are talking about the contemporary, you know, because we're now actually not apart from COVID. COVID uh, <laughs> entirely changed the nature of everything, of course. Uh, but even before COVID, we had to acknowledge that you know the cinema and, for example, the cinema theater. Uh, was only one dimension of uh, what cinema going was about. Most people uh, receive uh, cinema in other ways, not on your tablet, on your mobile, and on uh, by uh, uh, streaming services, no? over the top channels. So there's a new dimension to which uh, the cinema theater, which is the place where a public aggregated. No? Even now it's not gone and it will probably come back because there's a actually desire to be sociable when you go to the cinema as well. So that dimension is a, a huge change. I think the other thing which is important, uh, I have a great love for the earlier entertainment cinema, but now we are really getting a very diversified product. You know, it's hugely diverse. And I think that becomes, it's more experimental. There's more story attention to storytelling. You're getting also to a new realism, I suspect. A new dimension of realism is actually being made available through the cinema and, uh, in, you know, and going into say localities into small towns, 
into you know the everyday uh, dimension of life. It may be uh, through genre, through entertainment, but you're getting into new a new set uh, situations which was not available in the same fashion before the 2010. You know, before 2010, it was more this big entertainment form which was operational, no? rather than this. And I think that is a big challenge. Audience itself is now a very different form. It's a very different form because it's not a theatrical audience primarily. It tends to be domestic or personalized or individuated or a few people watching something together. You don't have the aggregation of audience, which does not mean that cinema doesn't have a public effect, but these are important questions. So next, uh, I'll just request, uh, Maitri has a question if uh, she's willing to uh, share her question on her own, Maitri. I'll just read it out, sir. Okay. Uh, the question is that uh, uh, she's asking that could we read the focus on hands and eyes in Bimal Roy's tins for India as an emphasis on reading the human body as part of industrial process itself, as Dickens does in novel Hard Times, use of mantelons of hands to signify factory workers. Mm. No, absolutely. I think that's a very good parallel, Maitri. I think that's exactly the type of thing I was trying to suggest. And it's very interesting, you know, Dickens in the late 19th century, he's actually often becomes a reference point. Even for, if you look, Sergei Eisenstein, you know, the very well-known Soviet filmmaker and experimentalist, he often uh, was always comparing cinema and uh, uh, the modern uh, novel. Of course, uh, Dickens was a very complicated chap because his uh, sometimes his books are uh, an aggregation of seriality, you know, that they are, they are actually uh, tap, uh, written every week, you know, and then they're aggregated. But um, certainly this new dimension you know, of modernity, we'll call it more broadly modernity, that this peculiar fragmentation of the body and the way the body is made functional to industrial requirements, you know, uh, rather than in the past, you know, where you are actually an artisan uh, with specialist skills and uh, in a small unit, which is not here. Every people are, what is it? Uh, parts, of, uh, 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 parts of an object are being put together by different people. Now that's one thing. And then you yourself, only a part of you has to be focused to facilitate that manufacture. And I think hands and eyes and feet, we also noticed, we come in, but not only that, uh, things like stillness, it's all in relationship to the machinic requirement and the rhythm of the of the machine. So this is, I thought, why that's very powerful. And, and the parallel you are making with Dickens and the late 19th century novel of that sort is absolutely accurate, I think. So we are just left with three more questions. I'll just ask them quickly so that we are through with it. Uh, there's a question by mm -hmm. Dr. Vinay Vikas. He's asking that what is the difference between new realism and magic realism in context of cinema? And Pakiza, is it new realism? I would not, you know, I've never thought of Pakiza in terms of realism, huh? either magic or new, 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 because it was really, it is such an um, ornate thing, you know, it's like very much a, it's, it's not a, it is a fantasy. At one level, there's a fant fantasy dimension of it, you know. And one could say it's also male fantasy, whatever you want to call it. But it is an extremely ornate uh, thing where the set, you know, the art direction uh, is not meant to kind of represent something in realistic in the world because it is made of color and of, you know, texture, which is very specifically uh, like a studio set. And I think that's very beautiful. Huh? It can be, it is artifice rather than realist, you know. It is man visibly manufactured uh, for a particular effect rather than trying to evoke things in the world. So that would be, but difference between magic realism and all that is obviously there's a long tradition uh, where the image actually kind of ceases to have a relationship to the real and it acquires a different type of texture and a kind of network of meaning. And it can go from surrealism to magic realism, I suppose, in that sense. Uh, but uh, uh, yeah. Next question by Dr. Rashi Mishra. She's asking that uh, definitely the power of in images does create meaning and it 
it is an important pedagogical tool for teaching cultural studies but how could it be rightly communicated and interpreted by the audiences mainly students of younger age in today's time as yeah. in case of teaching untouchability with achut kanya yeah. Uh, you know, this is so uh, obviously relevant what uh, you have said because you know this is uh, one is for uh, the conventions of those times, the ways in which social change was envisaged, even the categories which people are using, like untouchability. You know, uh, it is no longer something which is uh, common anymore, and it should, no longer should be common huh? because a different set of assertions uh, have emerged, and that is completely right. But nevertheless, one has to see things historically. And if whatever was at that time, we may have our critical engagement with it. And often it was the fact that these are victims. No, the other side of the point is very rare that they bear agency, you know, or that they actually have a capacity in themselves to transform the world uh, or to change their situation. So it's very much an upper caste vision uh, in that sense. No? Uh, and there's no denying that at all. At the same time, it just opens a space to think about these relationships. I thought, say, Tukaram and all is actually much more complex. I mean, it doesn't address untouchability at all. It addresses a wide and diverse range of social experience. Uh, next question, sir, by Dr. Shazia Siddiqui Khan. She is asking that since cinema involves the audio visual aspect inherent in it, so compared to printing or written literature, is the technical analysis of cinema, like shots, camera, angle, etc., more important than content analysis and appreciation, sir? What is your point of view on this? Well, what I think, uh, Sazia, I think it's uh, best to think of these things together, but not to, uh, the technique is absolutely critical to express content. For, for content to be understood, one needs to actually be aware of, uh, analyze the technique. Why is you know, you can say that some, this is what happened, or this is the meaning of this story. But if one leaves it at that, then one is not actually addressing what cinema is doing with it. You know? And that's where, for example, how do you build an emotional engagement or feeling for individual, for characters? Maybe it is not centered on one person. It may be also, for example, several people with conflicting things. You know, there are very complex ways in which say short setups, short distances, uh, sound and uh, musical elements, how they actually shape our kind of engagement, you know, in a way we are reading something. You know? So content is actually being shaped by those things. Uh, sir, just uh, one comment from your side that uh, as Ashwin Anshu is saying that definitely uh, the documentary on pin making that was being shown here, more or less, it is like uh, uh, American documentary, whether it is pronunciation or accent, to represent the value of modernity. So does it anyway speak about the derivative nature of Indian cinema? You know, I think um, uh, filmmaking is a transnational pursuit. You know, people see films, they actually interact with other filmmakers, they travel. Uh, so, you know, to actually kind of specify that this is derivative, non -der you can say it is comparable to other work being done elsewhere. And um, at the same time, there are certain dimensions here which I haven't quite seen elsewhere. This whole notion about the afterlife of the object is very suggestive, I think, you know, the way tin is recycled and read. We don't see it that readily in other kind of uh, industrial movies, uh, say in the US, USSR or uh, in, in the US. Uh, the voiceover, it may have be a, a peculiar thing because <laughs> the voiceovers those days were this slightly kind of, you know, these very British accented uh, uh, narrators. Uh, sometimes what will happen is that you will have uh, local language versions as well. I'm not sure. I can't say if this happened with Tins for India or not. Huh? But that is very typical. That particular, what we call a fruity British voice, you know, it's, it's, like, it's like out of key. Out of key with what you're actually seeing, you know, often. Uh, so we are having more questions, but now we are running out of time. So we'll be That's going, okay, I'm uh, so sorry I took a bit short, longer. Yeah, yeah. yeah, a very short uh, uh, line or two on your comment regarding parallel cinema or art cinema. And yeah. uh, after that, sir, I'll wind up the session. 
uh, yeah. the thanks to you, sir. Just a comment because uh, I don't want to uh, give participants away that our answer question is. Okay, okay. So uh, a very the, sorry, short comment uh, for the, that. What is the difference between difference between parallel cinema or art cinema? Okay, okay. You know, actually, parallel cinema. You know, sometimes these categories they are made by critics, huh? or by it's not necessary that there's a it it and that sticks uh, for a period. Uh, say 1970s cinema, post 1969, I would say, it had several distinctive things. It's to do with finance. That they got some state finance from the Film Finance Corporation, the National Film Development Corporation. Sometimes they call New Indian cinema. Sometimes they call parallel cinema. Okay, uh, there would be an argument about what is an, is this an art cinema or not. There will also be differences amongst these people. For example, Mani Kaul and Kumar Sahani. Huh? Uh, that is, they were making films at the same time as Sham Benegal. Okay, and uh, Sham Benegal is still making uh, films right now. He's making a film on Sheikh Mujibur Rahman huh? uh, at the age of eighty-four. Mark you, he's doing it, wonderful. Um, and they had very sharp criti uh, critical differences about how they should make films. Huh? Now, I will say that they're both involved, all are involved in some kind of artistic enterprise, uh, trying to use cinema with uh, great skill, imagination, but they have differences about how it, so one should not say just one thing, this art, you know, it's, there, some person will say avant-garde. Huh? And there'll be all sorts of category differences, but, and there's been uh, interesting writing. I can uh, suggest some readings for that as well. Hmm? Thank you, sir. Uh, I just would like to thank you, sir. Uh, on behalf of uh, IQAC Atma Ram Sanatanjan College, sir, and TVLC Ramanujan College for your dialect on cinema as classroom of the senses. Sir, in his discussion, has highlighted cinema as a means of information, instruction, education, and propaganda for critical awareness. The films were categorized by Sir as instructional, educational, promotional, and it was amazing to watch and listen to the analysis of Sir on tins for India, which has described different ways in which uh, tins were used in rural India. To personally share my perspective on the movie, definitely, I think that it gives a bit of reuse, recycle, and reduce in 1940s only, being part of culture of rural India. Perspective of Sir about a truth Kanya was very interesting, and the movie can now be watched by us with a changed perspective after this discussion on messages being conveyed by movie on social harassment. Sir even touched upon the fiction movies in his presentation through video clips on Sri Krishna Jan and Sant Sukaram. Personally, it is always amazing to listen to how each scene in a video clip has its own meaning when put for discussion before learned academicians like Professor Vasudevan. Thank you, sir, for just sharing your time and gracing your, this session with your benign presence. Thank you from all of us. Thank you. Sir. Uh, thank you, Anjali. Thank you, Maitri. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Okay, sir. All the best. Thank you. And I'll send you a, li a list of reading. Uh, definitely, sir. We'll share thanks. it with the participants. I'll do that. Thank definitely. You. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Okay. Thank you. With this, we come to the end of this session and over to the next moderator office.